We're going to finish up today, Jesus, the exact image of Father God. This is going to be part five. And what we want to start off with is just a refresher on what the rightly dividing steps are. So there's seven things that we need to do whenever we're facing some challenging scripture. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to pray about the challenging scripture. You know, one of the Holy Spirit's objectives is he is the spirit of truth and he will guide us into all truth. He's also our teacher. And therefore, we need to lean on the Holy Spirit and ask him to help us with whatever scripture is challenging us. And then secondly, we need to look at other Bible translations. And when we look at these other translations, a lot of times the issues will clear up because one translator may have picked a more appropriate uh, English word or phraseology that's a better rendition of what the original language intent was. You know, the third thing we can do is we can look up definitions of words. And when we do that, we're going to see some of our issues will begin to clear up, especially things related to like eternal punishment, eternal condemnation, things like that. Um, you'll see that the words translated in English as eternity don't actually mean eternity. They mean an unspecified age of time, which could be as short as you know minutes. It could be three days. It could be hundreds of years or it could be eternity. But it's the age itself that defines the duration, not the word Ion, Ionios, or Olam, you know, just as one example. But when you look up definitions of words, you're going to get some of your answers. Okay, then very importantly, number four and number five here, and number four is compare your scripture against the actions and life of Jesus in the Gospels. Okay, so his actions, you can't really question his actions in the Gospels. You know, they are, they are what they are, and so there's no misinterpretation of it. You know, when you see him, when you look at his actions, you see he was always healing. He was always dead raising. He was always devil casting. He was saving from death and destruction and all the works of the devils. But you never see him doing anything harmful whatsoever. And so his actions are very easy to understand. And when you have scriptures that contradict Jesus's actions in the gospel, then that is, you know, one of the foundational things to rightly divide with Jesus's actions and his inactions. For example, his inactions would be, we never saw him kill anybody. We never saw him punish anybody. We never saw him curse anybody. We never saw him bring a trial and tribulation upon anyone. Amen? Okay, so his actions and his inactions reveal the character and nature of God and are a major instrument to rightly divide. Then we have, um, we want to compare our challenging scripture against words of Jesus in the Gospels and words of you know spoken by the holy spirit through the new testament authors and then we're going to have you know clear statements you know like death is an enemy of god jesus came to destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil um, jesus was anointed with the holy spirit and he was going about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil so those are really crystal clear scriptures that tell us you know where death and sickness come from comes from the devil right and so those words will help us profoundly and rightly dividing the word okay the sixth thing is it is prudent to get multiple witnesses to whatever conclusion you're you're working towards so if i have a challenging scripture and i want to say you know i think that's of the devil well i better be confident about that assessment right and so i want to add as many witnesses so i want to get some some witnesses from the actions and inactions of jesus I want to get some more witnesses from Jesus, his own words himself, if possible. I want to get further witness from the Holy Spirit, his words in the New Testament, if possible. So I want to get as many witnesses as I can to get to the right conclusion and to have confidence in that conclusion and to have all that I need to be able to discuss and, and argue my case with anyone who wants to contradict me. Amen. And so you've seen in the examples we talked about already, and you'll see again today, whenever I do go over a challenging passage of scripture, I'm going to provide an abundance of witnesses. You know, I really want to show, you know, five, 10 different ways that the things I'm saying, they are true. And there's lots of scripture behind the things that I say. Amen. So I am rightly dividing using the Bible itself as the primary instrument. Then the last thing is just, Deciding what are you going to do with the scripture in question? You can reject it. You can correct it. You can set it aside for a future time and try and get you know more understanding from the Holy Spirit. You know, so make a decision about it. 
but make sure whatever decision you make, you have all sufficiency of evidence so that you are confident. Amen. And again, don't forget that the Holy Spirit, his job is to guide you into all truth. Okay, let's do a quick recap on a few scriptures for a few topics. So first of all, we just talked about, you know, we want to rightly divide by using Jesus's life example. It's important for us always to remember that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus is the exact image of Father God. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. He who has seen me has seen the Father. And then we have other passages like in Hebrews, Jesus is the exact representation of Father. He is the exact character, the exact image of him. He is the image of the invisible God. And there's even more scriptures. So when we're looking at Jesus in the Gospels, we're seeing an exact image of Father God. And because Jesus is unchanging, and because Jesus is the image of Father God, therefore Father God, and also by extension the Holy Spirit, they are unchanging forevermore. Um, all of the Godhead is the same yesterday, today, and forever. To put this into practice, just think about Jesus's life examples and the works that he did and the works that he did not do. And I'm not going to go through these, but you can just take a quick screenshot real quick and you can refer back to them. Okay, the next thing I wanted to do a recap on is we need to rightly divide using words of Jesus and the Holy Spirit from the New Testament. And we have John 10.10, 10, you know, the thief is the one who steals, kills, and destroys. That's the devil. That's his demons. That's all of his power of stealing, killing, destroying, making sick. You know, Jesus, he gives life and life abundantly. We have Jesus saying that he did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So Jesus is never a destroyer, but he's always a savior because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, we have the Holy Spirit telling us that death is an enemy of God. It's not his instrument. It's not his tool. We have the Holy Spirit telling us that Jesus came to this earth and one of his purposes was to destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And this is one of the most clear scriptures in the entire Bible about who is responsible for death, who has the power of death. The devil has the power of death, and God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit have the power of life. Amen. They don't trade their tools back and forth. The power of death belongs to, to the devil. The power of life belongs to Jesus. We have Acts 10, 38, and it tells us that, you know, God, which is Father, anointed Jesus, the Son, with the Holy Spirit. So we have the Godhead in agreement on the works of Jesus, that he, on the works that Jesus was doing, and the work that Jesus was doing with respect to healing was he was healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Okay, well, this is crystal clear. When you read the Old Testament, it's very clear that God himself is, is the one doing all of the making sick and killing and trials and tribulations. That's the way it's written because there is a veil over the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit in the New Testament and Jesus's own words clarify that actually it's the devil that was making people sick. It's the devil that was oppressing people with sickness. It's the devil who has the power of death and is going about killing people. Okay, and so there's many more passages, but we want to rightly divide using the words of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And this is a an excellent page with great scriptures to use for rightly dividing. So please take a screenshot of this one. Okay, now what I want to focus on today, we have two passages. We have um, both of them are from Numbers. They're from the Old Testament. And we have the children of Israel. They're basically they're asking for food. And supposedly God sends a plague and God sends serpents, um, and this results in death of many people. And in one of the cases, it actually results in the worship of the serpent. So what is going on here? So let's read these passages, and then we're going to go through a series of questions and answer them. And then as we're questioning things, then we're going to get a very confident conclusion on how to rightly divide these passages. So we'll start in Numbers chapter 11. Then you shall say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat, for you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. Now a wind went out from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea, and left them fluttering near the camp about a day's journey on this side, and about a day's journey on the other side all around the camp, and about two cubits above the surface of the ground. 
And the people stayed up all that day, all night, and all the next day, and gathered the quail. He who gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. So he called the name of that place Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had yielded to craving. Okay, so this is, you know, it started off good and then it turned evil. And so it's questionable for us, right? Like, why would God, you know, answer their prayer and you know, they wanted me to eat and then he actually provides, right? So that seems good, right? So they prayed, they wanted food, they wanted something to eat, they wanted something besides manna. It's understandable. Could you imagine eating the same thing every day for year upon year upon year? And, and so they wanted meat to eat. What a horrible thing to ask for. Okay. And, and so anyway, they, they wanted meat. And then God sent a wind and it brought quail in from the sea. So everything's good so far. But then all of a sudden, it's like um, he gets mad all of a sudden in verse 33. And while they're chewing on the meat, or actually before it was chewed, while the meat is in their mouth right before they chewed it, then supposedly he gets mad and he puts sickness, he puts plague into the food. And so when they eat it, the people get sick from the plague in the meat and then they die. Well, that's evil. Okay, well, we just read some passages that said the devil has the power of death, that God gives life and not death. So why would God act as though he's answering a prayer, bring forth the provision and then convert it into an instrument of death while the people are chew, um, begin to chew on it. Why would he do that? Okay, so that doesn't make sense. That's evil. You know, why, why would you tease them? Why would you tease them with the food and then convert it to sickness and then kill them? That's evil. Okay, let's read the next one. Numbers 21, 5 to 9. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Okay, so there's so many things wrong with this passage. So first of all, the children of Israel, they committed this terrible crime that they wanted food and they wanted water. I mean, just the basic necessities of life is all they wanted. And God supposedly got angry with them because they wanted food and water. Like, how dare they ask for food and water? I mean, of all things, can you believe they're asking for food and water? So that made him mad. And so supposedly God sent fiery serpents to bite and kill the people. Well, that's just straight up evil. You know, they want food and water. That's not like they're asking for mansions and millions or anything like that. Food and water. Come on. And so he got mad and sent snakes to bite and kill them. That is extremely evil. So what's going on here? This can't be good God doing this. You know, who has the power of death? The devil has the power of death. Okay, and then this gets actually even worse because then um, God supposedly tells them to make an image of the beast, a fiery serpent, and put it on a pole. Well, if you go back to the law that was given to Moses, wasn't one of those commands not to make a graven image, you know, not to worship idols, you know, right? So we know that throughout all the Old Testament scriptures and a little bit in the New Testament, it talks about not worshiping idols or graven images. Well, then why would God tell them to make an image and put it on a pole? Okay, that would be in contradiction to commands that, that he had given previously, right? Okay, and so basically... God supposedly is telling them to make this this image and then to worship it when you know to behold it to look upon it. Okay, well this looking upon it that's 
a form of worship. They're beholding the serpent on a pole. They're worshiping an image of the beast is literally what's happening. Okay, and yes, there is a type and shadow application of this, you know, to where, you know, Jesus took the curse upon himself. He took sin upon himself on the cross. All of that is true. But from these people's perspective, you know, they don't know about all those things, right? They're literally, they're worshiping an image of the beast on a pole. That's what they're literally doing. And that is absolutely ungodly. It's taboo. And it contradicts other things that God has said repeatedly. And so when they worship the serpent upon a pole, then they would live. Okay, well, let's talk about this. So how are we going to rightly divide it? So one of the easiest things to do is just make a list of questions and make a list of questions and then just step through them methodically and answer the questions, apply scriptures to your answers, and then you're going to have an excellent case of that you have established, an excellent case, a set of questions about the passage, a set of questions about the nature of God, and then you're going to bring in scriptures. And then that gives you just an, a legal argument. <laughs> Literally, it gives you a legal argument for your conclusion about rightly dividing. And always remember that Jesus was busy rightly dividing. And in fact, we're going to see Jesus actually rightly divided this passage in Numbers 21 for us. And you're going to see that come about. Okay, the first thing, there's always these basic questions we can ask. And these are very simple tools. And these Really, you don't have to go beyond point A. Who has the power of sickness and plague? Who has the power of death? Well, didn't we just look at that? Okay, so we just saw that the power of sickness and plague is just a pernicious form of sickness. It is a, a very contagious, a very rampant, a very generally of high consequence, you know, a, a deadly disease. You know, a plague is a deadly disease that tends to be very virulent. Okay, well, it's still a sickness. And so Jesus was healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So anytime somebody has a healing need, they are oppressed by the devil. So the first part of the question here, who has the power of sickness and plague? It's obviously the devil. Okay, then who has the power of death? You know, we have many scriptures on that. John 10, 10, Luke 9, 56, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Like all these passages tell us that the power of death belongs to the devil. Okay. So we could stop right there. Then we know. Then we could go further because we want to build a huge list of evidence, right? Sometimes you can build a huge list of evidence. Sometimes you can't. You know, we could we could be satisfied with our conclusion already that we know from the Holy Spirit who has the power of sickness and plague, and we know who has the power of death. So that would be sufficient to stop right there. Okay, but we can go much further in this particular passage. You know, who redeems and saves from these things? Well, Jesus in Galatians 3.13, you know, he redeemed us from curse. Plague is a curse. He's redeemed us from that. All the things that Jesus is redeeming us from, he's redeeming us from works of the devil. Okay, so that's more evidence. You know, Jesus, he also redeems us from death. He's not the cause of death. He's the answer to death, right? So there's more evidence there. Okay, well, does God lie? This is another question. Does God lie? Does he murder? Would good God promise you meat? To fulfill your request and then poison it to murder you okay well let's just let's just reread a little bit right here in numbers 11 then you shall say to the people consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat for you wept in the hearing of the lord saying who will give us meat to eat the lord therefore the lord will give you meat and you shall eat okay so the people prayed they cried out to god and they asked for meat. And then what did he say? He said, I will give you meat to eat and you shall eat. Okay, so he's telling them, hey, I'm answering your prayer. Okay, so would God would God lie to the people? Would he pretend? Would he like tell them a, a joke or tell them some sick joke or a story? Hey, I'm, I'm answering your prayer. I'm going to give you meat to eat. And then turn around and murder them with the food that he's giving them. Would he do that? Well, of course not. Okay, well, let's look at John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, and the, de and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Okay, from the words of Jesus himself, he says 
that the devil is the father of all lies and the devil is a murderer from the beginning. Okay, so in this passage, we have God seemingly lying to the people because he told them, I'm going to answer your prayer and you will have meat to eat. Okay, that's a clear answer to prayer. Okay, and, and then he provided the food. But then, you know, he changes his mind, and which means he lied before. And then he puts sickness in the food. And so the people get sick with this great plague, and then they die. Okay, well, that would be a work of the devil. Lying about answering the prayer and then murdering them with the food that was provided. Those would be works of the devil. So, you know, what I would be inclined to say is that God truly was um, answering their prayer. Tr God truly was, truly did bring them food to eat. And then the devil came along and did his work and cursed the food as the people were eating it. That makes a lot of sense because we know that God promises to answer our prayers, especially when we're praying for some basic need in life, like food and water. Amen. Okay, let's go back to point A for a minute. So I just wanted to say that the same things that we mentioned about the power of sickness and death, again, those same scriptures, they also apply to Numbers 21. You know, of course, sickness isn't in this passage, but death is in this one. So you would ask yourself the same questions. Who has the power of death? It's the devil. And, you know, sending snakes to bite and kill people, that's obviously of the devil. So I didn't mention that a second ago, but I wanted to go ahead and say that. Okay, well, let's go on to point C. So in this second passage, you know, you see that the, the children of Israel, they were asking for food and water, and God supposedly sent snakes to bite and kill them. Okay, well, Jesus directly addressed this in Matthew chapter 7. And let's just read that real quick. We're going to read verse 7 to 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you, who if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Okay, we can actually use this passage to rightly divide both Numbers 11 and Numbers 21. Okay, first of all, he's saying that, that these people are evil. In verse 11, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. So what Jesus is saying is that even the evil fathers of this earth, if their children ask for food, even you evil fathers would not give your child a serpent. Even you evil fathers would not give your child a stone if he's asking for bread. So he's saying, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? So what he's saying is, evil fathers don't give serpents to their children who ask for food. Evil fathers don't give deadly and worthless things to their children who ask for food. So much more will your heavenly father give good things. So he's like, he's laying it out right here. Evil fathers don't give deadly things to their children when they ask for food. And so much more will father God who is in heaven give good things to those who ask. So if the evil fathers won't give deadly things to their children, so much more would your father in heaven never give deadly things to those who ask, but he will give good things to those who ask. Well, what happened in Numbers 11? They asked for food, the food was given, and then it was converted into poison. Well, we know right there from this passage, Father God would never do that. Then we, then we have a much more specific application of Matthew 7, because literally they asked for food and water, and literally snakes were sent to bite and kill them, which is the exact thing that Jesus is saying over here. You know, he's saying, you evil fathers would not even give snakes to bite and kill your children when they're asking for food and water. So much more will your father in heaven give the good things to those who ask. So if father was answering this prayer, he would give them food and he would give them water. 
And he even said in the same passage, ask and it will be given to you. So good God, he will answer your prayer for food and water. Good God did answer it up here in Numbers chapter 11. And I suppose he never had a chance to answer it in Numbers 21 because the devil had already sent these snakes to start biting and killing people. Amen. Because God has said, you know, I will give it to you. Ask and it will be given. Give to him who asks you. Amen. So if these people are asking for food and water, God has obligated himself by his word to provide those needs. And Jesus has told us that. Amen. And Jesus told us very specifically. Jesus was directly, rightly dividing Numbers 21 with what he said in this passage. That Father God would never give a serpent to his children when they are asking for food. He would never do that. He would give good things. And in fact, he would give the good things that you were asking for. Amen. So this is an absolutely profound act of rightly dividing that Jesus is doing right here. Amen. Okay. Another thing you could think about is we, we see in Matthew 5, 42, give to him who asks you. Okay, we see in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. So we see that God is saying that, you know, we should give to anyone who's asking us for something. Amen. We shouldn't turn away from them, but we should give to those who are asking. And then he also says, you know, we are commanded to give, but God has also obligated himself to give when we ask. Okay, so is God a hypocrite? You know, if... If God has instructed us that we must give to him who asks, and God, you know, via Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. And this is during the old covenant, even when Jesus is saying this. So nothing would have changed from back in the days of numbers. You know, would God instruct us to give when somebody asks, yet he himself would not give? Would God tell us to give the good thing to somebody who's asking of us? But then he turn around and give evil things like plagues and fiery serpents to kill. You know, is he a hypocrite? No, of course he's not a hypocrite. Amen. So obviously the devil is intervening in these passages. Obviously the devil is doing the works of sickness, death, and destruction. Um, we can see that God was doing the work of bringing forth the provision and, until the devil came and spoiled it. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, we saw in Numbers 21, around verse 8, he said, make a fiery serpent and then worship the pole and you're going to live. Okay, well, who is the serpent? What does the Bible say about worshiping idols? Who are you worshiping when you are beholding a snake? Who fell from heaven because he wanted to be worshiped? Okay, and the answer to all these questions, you know, it's the devil, right? So let's just look at some scriptures. Uh, Revelation 12, 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, so here we see four names of the devil. He's called the dragon, he's called the serpent, he's called the devil, and he's called Satan. Okay, so when you are beholding an image of a serpent upon a pole, you are beholding the devil. You are worshiping the devil. You are adoring the devil. Amen. So that is obviously that's that's evil. These people were brought into a deception to where they're bowing down to the devil and unbeknownst to them. And and again, a type and a shadow is something that you draw as a conclusion later on for a future people. At the time this is happening, they are literally worshiping the devil. They are literally worshiping a serpent on a pole, and they are literally uh, violating the law itself. If you go to Leviticus 26, 1, you shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. Okay, well, he specifically told them to make an idol and to worship it. Amen. So this is, this is a contradiction even to the Old Testament itself. This is a contradiction to the law. As we see in Leviticus, you shall not make idols, period, end of story. Well, what is a serpent on a pole? It's an idol. In fact, it's an idol to worship the beast, to worship the devil, to worship a serpent who is the dragon, who is the devil, who is Satan on a pole. Amen? So it is absolutely taboo, even according to the law. 
Okay, so what we can very conclusively say, you know, by answering these questions is absolutely both of these passages, you know, any good portion of these passages is going to be Father God, you know, because every good thing comes down from the Father of lights. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Amen. Our Father in heaven. So Father God is the ultimate source of every everything good. All good things exist because of God. Amen. Okay, so we have a good thing, the initial provision of meat, that was a good thing, that was from God. Then the, the cursing of it, cursing as a work of the devil, putting plague in it, that is cursing the food. We would call that food poisoning or something like that, plague, worse than ordinary food poisoning, obviously. So he poisoned the meat. The devil poisoned the meat. The devil used an instrument of sickness and death, and he killed the people. Amen. Not only did he kill them, but he tortured them. A plague. When you die of sickness, you are tortured to death because sickness is not instantaneous. Sickness takes some amount of time and therefore they're suffering and that suffering is torture. So the devil tortured these people with a plague to kill them. Amen. So that is obviously a work of the devil. Then we can clearly see the devil is responsible for all the death and destruction and the idol worship. Um, that's happening in, in Numbers 21. So we have much evidence to conclusively say all the evil things happening here are of the devil. The good thing that began to happen in Numbers 11, that's of God. Amen? All right, so that would be our conclusion there. So let's go on. So in conclusion, so number one, you know, Jesus is the true image of God. He is the exact character and representation of Father this is the simplest statement we can make. You know, Jesus told us to look at himself. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So whenever we get confused about, you know, who God is and what he looks like, then we just need to look at Jesus in the Gospels and realize that he is the exact character and representation of God. And therefore, we can have peace by beholding Jesus. Okay, number two, God never changes and is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, people will say that, you know, in this dispensation, God was killing babies and having women, you know, sending enemies to rape the women and rip them open and kill the babies and do all these terrible things and slaughter every breathing creature, man, woman, child, animal. You know, you know, he was in this dispensation of the Bible. He was doing those things. But now he's a reformed baby killer. And now he doesn't kill babies anymore. OK, this whole dispensationalism it's all a lie. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never was a baby killer. He never was a killer of every breathing thing. He never was a warmonger. He never was, he isn't, and he never will be. Amen. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is a conclusive and permanent statement. Number three, we need to focus on the new covenant. Too many churches are teaching the from the Old Testament and you can teach certain things from the Old Testament, but we are not to teach law and curse. We're not to be wrapped up in festivals or anything like that. We're not to be wrapped up in special days and eating certain things and not eating others. We have nothing to do with the law. We are to focus on the new covenant. We are not preachers and teachers of the whole Bible. We are ministers of the new covenant, not the old covenant. The old covenant is the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation written and engraved on stones. We do not teach that. Amen. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's very important. Number four, if you do venture in the Old Testament, you need to remember that there is a veil that obscures your vision. And we have God and the devil are written together as one person. And we must rightly divide through the discerning of the spirits by the power and the help of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so... We always get this idea in our mind, well, now that I've had this teaching, I'm going to go back and reread the Old Testament, and it's going to be crystal clear. Well, it's it's still going to say the same things it said before. It's still going to be uncomfortable. It's still going to be God and devil mingled together, and you're going to question everything all over again. But be aware there is a veil, and God and devil are mingled together. So it is confusing. There's no way around it. You're going to read it. It will be confusing, and then you have to go in and rightly divide it and make sense of it, okay? So that discomfort is always going to be there. You're always going to have to remember the veil, and you're always going to have to rightly divide. I personally do not make a habit of reading the Old Testament. I am a minister of the New Covenant, 
And my mission is to do the works of Jesus and greater works. That's my mission in life. That is my commission from Jesus. That is your commission from Jesus. We are not ministers of the old covenant. So I, I don't spend much time there at all. Number five, Jesus is home base. You know, Jesus is the reset button. If you ever have a question about the character and nature of Father God, go back and look at Jesus in the Gospels, and then you're going to get clarity. Add more evidence to your conclusion with other scriptures as needed or desired. Okay, so whenever you have a question about the character and nature of God, the first thing to do is always remember Jesus, he's home base. You know, Father God looks like Jesus. He's home base. That's that's my place of comfort. Or you could say, Jesus is the reset button. If my image of God gets confused, go back, I look at Jesus, and then I get clarity. Because Father God is exactly like Jesus in the Gospels. Okay, and then you can further clarify, as we've talked about, you know, add more scriptures to whatever, um, whatever, you know, rightly dividing idea you have. Okay, number six, always remember, Jesus did not accept all scripture. Jesus himself rightly divided by rejecting and correcting various Old Testament scriptures. Number seven, we are called to rightly divide. We must follow Jesus's example to get a clear image of Father God. There are multiple passages that tell us we must rightly divide. There are multiple passages where we see Jesus rightly dividing. It is a necessary and expected thing. If we do not rightly divide, then we will draw some false conclusions and we may even hold blasphemous thoughts about our Father, thinking that he's part evil. Okay, number eight, Jesus, Father, and Holy Spirit are perfectly aligned in goodwill, in thought, in deed, and action. Jesus was not rescuing us from a half-evil Father God. Jesus came to this earth to destroy the works of the devil. Okay, so there's people that will say that, you know, Jesus came to save us from the Father's wrath and curse because, you know, Father was angry about sin. And Jesus didn't come to save us from Father. Jesus came to save us from the devil. Always remember always remember that. Jesus, Father, and Holy Spirit, they were always aligned in purpose. They, they share one common goodwill. They share a common mode of thought. They share a common purpose, which is to save mankind from all the works of the devil and to destroy the works of the devil and to bring forth our salvation. That is a shared purpose amongst the Godhead. Number nine. Blasphemy has its root in thinking evil of God. It is not blasphemy and it is not heresy to rightly divide the word to prove that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Amen. So blasphemy, it is not blasphemy to question scriptures. It is not blasphemy to reject a scripture. Jesus did this himself. It is the beginning of blasphemy to be thinking that you know, Father God's a baby killer. That is a blasphemous thought. And if you start proclaiming that to other people, saying you know, God was killing babies in the Old Testament, you are blaspheming Father God. Amen? He's not a baby killer. He's not one who sends enemies to rip open the pregnant women. He's not one who sends you know, enemies to, you know, to slaughter his people as punishment. He's not one who sends you to go kill every living, breathing thing in another village or another town. You know, he's not a warmonger. He's not any of those things. So if we are thinking thoughts like that in our heart, we are beholding an evil image of Father God. And that is that is the root of blasphemy, is thinking evil things about Father. Number 10, when you have an image of Father God that looks like Jesus in the Gospels, you will love God and be rich and effective in faith. And this is so true. You know, my initial experience with God was when he saved me from addiction. And I had been bound up in that for decades and I couldn't get free. And then when I turned to God, he set me free despite how sinful I was. And, and so I love God. You know, my first experience with him was that he was merciful. He was loving. He, he saved me like for eternity. And he saved me from this addiction. He was a healer. Amen. And then I got into an Old Testament Bible study where they were teaching that God was the source of sickness and death and destruction, and that he uses those things to punish us and to teach us and to refine us through the fire and whatever other ideology they have. And all of that is wrong doctrine. The devil is the source of all those things. Amen. So when you have wrong doctrine, 
And, and when you have a wrong image of God, you're not going to love him, you're not going to like him, and you're going to be weak in faith. When you correct your image of Father God, then you will love him, and you will trust him, and then you will become effective in faith. Amen? And that is our objective. Love, love for God, and effectiveness in faith. Okay, and let's just wrap up on this. You know, here are a set of questions about Jesus and the Gospels. You know, again, Jesus is the reset button. When you get a clearer picture of what Jesus did and didn't do, what he said and didn't say, what his redemptive works are, when you have a clear image of that, and then you put put that image, you let that image become your image of Father, then you have a perfect image of Father. So these are some questions you can always ask yourself and then answer them. And then that's going to reset your image of Father God as well. Yeah, How many evil deeds did Jesus do? None. How many people did Jesus kill? He never killed anyone. He only raised the dead. How many people did Jesus make sick? He never made anyone sick. He healed the sick. He healed them all. He healed anyone and everyone that came to him, whether they had faith, whether they didn't have faith, whether they were of Israel or whether they were a Gentile. He healed anyone that came to him. Not only that, but Jesus bore our sicknesses, he carried our pains, and he took stripes on his back to pay for our healing. You know, so he is the answer to sickness, but never the source of it. Number four, how many people did Jesus put curses upon? Jesus never put a curse upon anyone. Jesus was crying over Jerusalem as he was thinking about the curse that would come upon Jerusalem. And then Jesus, Galatians 3.13, he became a curse for us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Okay, Jesus is the answer to curse, not the source of curse. Therefore, that's why he never put a curse upon anyone. Therefore, Father God does not put curses upon people. Okay, how many people did Jesus bring a trial and tribulation upon? Nobody. So Father God is not sending trials and tribulations. Trials and tribulations come as a result of sowing and reaping. If we sow to the devil, we're going to reap from the devil. If we sow to God, we're going to reap from God. And so, you know, people that are wrapped up in sin and populations of people that are wrapped up in sin, they bring trial and tribulation upon themselves by way of their sin, which sows and receives from the devil. Amen. And, and so if people are tied up in sin, then they have distanced themselves from God because sin pushes us away from God. We push ourselves away from God by way of you know, perpetuating in sin, we push him away. We draw near by being free from sin. Amen. And so as we push God away through sin, then we become more and more vulnerable to the devil. And then there's trial, there's tribulation, there's curses, there's terrible things happening. It's not God that's doing them. It's the devil that does them. Okay. How many people did Jesus punish? Jesus never punished anyone. So always remember, he did not stone to death the woman who was caught in adultery. Even though the law said such should be stoned to death, he did not stone her to death. Um, somebody came to arrest him, to lead him away, to be tortured and killed. And Jesus healed him. When Peter cut his ear off, Jesus healed him. And, you know, if ever somebody was going to be punished, you would think it would be those who murdered God. And you know, Jesus was God in the flesh and they murdered him. And what did Jesus do? He prayed for them. So Jesus never punished anyone. So when there's things happening in the Bible that look like punishment, it's not that God is willfully, consciously punishing somebody and sending evil upon them. It's that when you know the sin of people separates them and pushes God further and further away. And the further away you get from God, the less and less of his benefits and protection that you experience. And then the more and more you experience of the devil, which is death, destruction, trial, tribulation, curse, and so forth. Okay, number seven, what did Jesus say about fire from heaven? You know, Jesus said that fire from heaven, it's of the wrong manner of spirit. You know, in Revelations, a true thing said in the book of Revelations is that fire from heaven is a working of the beast. And so what does that say about all the fire from heaven passages in the Old Testament? It wasn't God answering Elijah's prayer to, you know, burn alive 102 men with fire from heaven. You know, fire from heaven is, it's an instrument of death. The power of death belongs to the devil. Fire from heaven is a working of the beast from the book of Revelation. Fire from heaven is of the wrong manner of spirit, according to Jesus, right? So we can think about things like that. What did Jesus say 
about asking for food and giving a serpent. So we talked about this one today. You know, Jesus said that even evil fathers would not send snakes to bite and kill their children. And so much more will your father who is in heaven give good things. So God will give good things when we ask for things. He's not going to give us hurtful, harmful, deadly things like serpents or plagued meat. Okay, number nine, according to Jesus's teaching, would it be godly or ungodly to kill 42 children for calling someone a bald head? Okay, so this is a pretty specific question, but you know, you see a lot of killing of, of, of babies, of children in the Old Testament, and we're always going to question, like, how could God do that? Well, he didn't do it. You know, Jesus' teaching is a direct contradiction. You know, Elisha was called a bald head, and he, he prayed a curse upon those children, and God supposedly sent two bears out of the woods to rip to shreds and kill, to maul to death 42 children. Well, what did Jesus say you should do to someone who persecutes you? You should um, pray for your enemies. You should love your enemies. You should do good to your enemies, right? You are to bless your enemies. You know, Jesus said to bless our enemies. So it is completely and utterly ungodly to kill children for, you know, for something as minor as calling someone a bald head. There's no justification for killing, you know, children anyway, no matter what they did. Amen. Okay, so, okay, number 10. What does Jesus think about the death penalty? Well, Jesus did not uphold the death penalty. Again, think about the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. What does Jesus say about repaying evil with evil, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for life, a blow for a blow, a burn for a burn? You know, all of that, that's written in the law. And Jesus rejected that in Matthew chapter 5. What does Jesus say about taking oaths? Jesus said taking oaths is of the evil one, yet it's written in the law they're commanded to take oaths. Well, that portion of the law, that's not thats not from God. That's from the God of this world. If The God of this world, the devil, is the one who wants people to take oaths because when an oath is violated, then that gives him justification to bring stealing, killing, and destroying, to bring wrath, to bring, um, you know, to bring his evil works upon people. Amen? Because it's sin to swear to swear to God and then not uphold it, that is sin. And that, you know, the wages of sin is death. You know, when you sin, who are you bowing down to? You're bowing down to the devil. You are sowing to the devil and you will reap bad things from the devil. So the devil would love for you to take oaths and vows and commitments all day long and to violate them all. And then he's going to wreak havoc upon you. Jesus said, oaths, taking of oaths is of the evil one. Anything more than yes and no is of the evil one. Okay, number 13, what does Jesus say about fighting and warfare? Well, Jesus said that his kingdom is not of this world, therefore his disciples do not fight. So fighting and warfare and violence is not, it's not part of the kingdom of God. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it wasn't that God was a warmonger in the Old Testament, and then he paused his warmongeringness when Jesus came while it was still the Old Covenant, and then, um, and then set aside warfare until Revelation, and then resumes warfare in the book of Revelation. And that's ridiculous, it's false, it's wrong understanding. Okay, fighting, violence, murdering, and war is not part of the kingdom of God, past, present, or future. And so any fighting or warfare deeds that you see being done by God anywhere in the Bible, it is false, it is not of God, it is of the devil. Okay, number 14. What does Jesus say about the source of murder and lying? So any, again, anytime there's murdering happening, it's the devil. Anytime lying is happening, it's the devil. So you can think back in the Old Testament, and there are passages where Yahweh commissioned lying spirits to go out and to be a lying spirit in the mouth of someone's, uh, in someone's mouth. And so they would speak lies and bring forth death and destruction. Well, God doesn't send lying spirits. The devil sends lying spirits. So you see, you have to you have to rightly divide the things that you're reading. We have to hone in on Jesus, his actions, and his words as the number one highest form of truth. And then secondly, the, the things the Holy Spirit says in the New Testament would be number two. Amen. And so those words and actions and inactions of Jesus and the words of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, those things are our primary instrument to confidently, rightly divide the word. And 
if you feel uncomfortable rightly dividing, go back and read Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 7 and look at the obvious examples of Jesus rightly dividing. He did not accept anything evil about the nature of Father God. He rightly divided away those things. Amen? All right, well, I hope this teaching helps you. And this is a wrap for this one. And again, the purpose of this teaching was to be a simple and non-divisive way to address the topic of the goodness of God by looking at Jesus. Now, there are much more profound conclusions we could draw, but this is a simple and acceptable way where we can more easily share the truth about God's goodness with other people without it creating division in the body of Christ. Amen. God bless you and talk to you later.